Philip Hicks. We met about three or four months. He's been a pig trainer, a prisoner, and now a preacher. Philip Hicks shares. Philip Hicks takes us on a journey. It's about others. That's what Jesus was all about. It was about others. Philip Hicks. 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 Let them experience you as their father, their dad, who loves them, who never sleeps, and thinks about you around the clock. And let them experience Jesus as their personal Savior. So let's give a big Novato welcome to Phil Hicks. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. There was a movie or something some time ago called Man on Fire. Didn't get a lot of ratings, but Matt Kenny went to see it two or three times. So it was, yeah, yeah, it's sort of like Shawshank Redemption. I've seen that several times. Anything with a prison in it is kind of cl close to me. A lady on the porch outside this morning said, because the sign says, help send me back to prison. She said, why would you want to go back to prison? Or why would you want to go to prison? Well, to he who much is given, much is required. Amen. And God has given me so much. And because of that, he's called me to go back to where I met him. A lot of times we'll go through things in life and God shows up, we encounter him. And then when we are impacted, when we are changed at that place, he'll send you back there. He'll send you back there. I was a man on fire at an early age. I just didn't know that. Growing up in Memphis, I was religious. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a big difference knowing God in your mind versus your heart. Amen? I remember going to a church uh, 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 campfire meeting about seven or eight years of age. We were cooking marshmallows. Remember marshmallows on the coat hanger thing? They didn't have s'mores back then. And, uh, and there was a girl across the campfire from me, and we all had our coat hangers and all, and, and suddenly, suddenly our coat hangers got entangled with a mass of molten, burning marshmallow. She was pulling one day, I was pulling back and forth, back and forth, and suddenly she did what she should never do. She let go. And it was like slow motion as it drifted through the air and smacked me in the nose. I'm serious. To this day, I have a scar on my nose because of that, and I don't know if I've ever forgiven her, but I want it. feels good. Moving later in life, and since my dad wasn't in the house, look at that. Where'd that come? Eric, you're way ahead of, look. I didn't know you had this PowerPoint, honey. Look at this guy. I'm like doing from the pig pen to the prison to the pulpit right here. And I just, well, any, God, this, he's a way, this guy. Can you, are you available to travel? God, this is, it's amazing. I did this in a church in my hometown of Memphis, and uh, the, the thing malfunctioned so that we weren't able to show the video clips and the pictures. I praise God for you, Eric. Thank you. Let's give Eric and Carol a big hand. Amen. 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 And so even though my parents raised me up in church, is that someone's cell phone or your stomach? What is it? Okay. If everybody turn your cell phone off, I got my cell phone when I was in prison. It was on the wall outside my cell. Anyway, that's enough of that. Anyway, <laughs> people were lined up to use it, but it wasn't the first lineup they'd been in. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's an inside joke. Thank you. <laughs> the, I wish I had more time to do this because I've had so many wonderful experiences when I've ministered in prison because you experience the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of times when we fall down, there is none to help, as the scripture says in the bulletin today. We rebel against the words of God. We reject his counsel, whether our parents are raising us up and we say, no, we're rebelling against God. When we compromise in our workplace or anywhere else, we're rebelling against God. 
because it's God whose eyes move to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for those whose hearts are fully surrendered to him so he can what? Show himself strong on their behalf. My question today for me and my family and you as well, are we really fully surrendered? Because if we're not, we're just tying God's hands from what his word declares that he promises to do. As I kept getting older, uh, I remember going to Arkansas, where Grandpa Dudley's from, and I shot a firecracker off. The whole field went ablaze of fire. I ran down the road, quick, call the fire department. My grandpa, true story, said, we don't have no fire department. <laughs> so they did a bucket brigade, and you know what? I got the fire on my bottom end after that. I'm telling you, got a lot of those. A man on fire at an early age. Even as I went through Memphis State and, and they got into sports writing and then to Atlanta, out to Aspen, Colorado, and I was bartending there. But I was living with the daughter of a Baptist preacher from Alabama. We were going to church. We were singing songs, but our hearts were far from God because we were religious. We did not have a relationship. I remember my co-bar manager was from a town called Larkspur, California. His name was Ed Hoban, Redwood High School. Ed Hoban was his name. Went to school with a guy named Robin Williams. Robin was our clean comedian. Listen up, please, one second. Thank you. That was for Robin, not me. Thank you very much. <laughs> that I would be so vain. The, uh, uh, but, but Robin was very quiet off stage because he still was wearing all those masks, and I was wearing all this mask to cover up because I didn't know my true identity. I didn't know that I could find my, my identity in Christ Jesus alone if I'm really created in his image. And, and I remember learning to eat fire. A guy from Hollywood came in. We did a drum roll on the bar, on the, at the bar, a fake drum roll. And, and uh, did y'all like that drum playing this morning? Come on now. It's, just, well, it's a great worship. And uh, I said, it's a great worship. Wasn't it a great worship? Come on. It was. God loves to be worshiped. We come into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. When we don't feel good sometimes, get our eyes off our circumstances ourselves, and begin to get our minds on the Lord and begin to praise Him in all things and look out. He begins to lift, lift us above our circumstances because the psalmist says He inhabits the praises of His people. But of course, without Christ, I didn't have the power of God to, for Him to inhabit. And so... Ed Hoban and I, are we're, we're on two ends of the bar. Robin's standing over there. It's a break happy hour from uh, Robin did the comedy. And we're on each end of the bar with these lighters with a shot of 151 rum in our mouth. We're spraying them across the, uh, in, through the air. It crosses. And the people were cheering. Yeah, I'll throw the money on the bar, the tips. And, and then suddenly the rum tri trickled down my chin and I was caught afire. It's a true story. I ducked my upper body into the sink where you wash the glasses and shh, went out and boy, they were going, they thought I was a show. <laughs> Eric, can, you, we got to have this guy. This is amazing. Yeah, he stayed up all night to learn these pictures. Boy, that's, um, okay, you can take it off now. They're going to look at that instead of listening to me. You, you, you never want to minister the word with just eloquence or with funny and all. But you know what? It's fun to be a child of God. Amen. It's fun to be able to laugh at ourselves. Amen? Amen. And it's far better than laughing at other people. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so a guy came to Aspen spending lots of money and said, hey, if you ever go to Fort Lauderdale, I'll keep an apartment down there. I was 29 years of age. Still going through the motions, having a form of godliness with wearing all the mask. And I went down to Fort Lauderdale to spend two weeks of vacation. Another guy came down. He wasn't there for vacation. He had been ripped off in a drug deal months earlier. He painted a real simple picture that if I would help him gain access to this apartment, nobody would be there and the money would be there. You ever heard that story before? <laughs> By the way, how many ex-offenders we have in the house here today? Raise your hand if you're an ex-offender. Thank you for your honesty. So I guess the rest of you are still offending. <laughs> Think about it. For we all like sheep have gone astray, amen? And I was out reading this morning and it, it talked about how God, uh, he says when you commit adultery, even in your thought life, you're just as guilty. And the book of James says when you offend in one point, you're guilty of them all. 
So far be it from me to say, well, I, I might have done this sin, but he's a lot worse sinner, you know. Paul led the way. The chief of sinners. He and I are going to be having an argument about that one of these days. <laughs> Not that we're bragging. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> far be it from me to, to point fingers at anybody is the bottom line. Neither should we. As I volunteered very stupidly to get involved in this wrong choice, and life is all about choices. We can choose to do wrong or do choose to do right. We can choose life or death. We can choose to surrender to God or choose to sit on the fence. God says in Revelations, I want you to be hot or cold. I want you to be on fire for me or on fire for the devil because if you're lukewarm, you make me sick. God said that. And James says, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Neither should that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's the guy that makes God sick. That's the guy that would just bind God's hands from showing him he's so strong. He's after our hearts. He's after our whole hearts. As we prayed up here with Patrick and, and Brother Bill and this morning, I prayed, Lord, more of you and less of us. And then the song they sang was about more of him. And then another song they sang, it said about he satisfies the, the longing soul. God has put a longing soul, a thirst in us. And only he can fill that. But when we start to fill it with the wrong things, it just dilutes the water. It poisons the well, if you will. I think that was uh, 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 one of our, our, our congressmen said that the, after the election of the knife. Yes. If you're going to do that, you're going to poison the well. It's some dangerous stuff. God is a good God. He's a great God. He's a loving God, but he's also a just God. And when we cry in our trouble, see, the scripture says we fall down because of that compromise. We fall down and there is none to help. Then we cry out in our trouble. That's foxholes and, and prisons as far as I'm concerned. Why do people turn to God in prison? Well, God said it a long time ago. But there's a far worse prison than concrete and steel, and that's prisons of pride and indifference and a dull heart and of prejudice and all kinds of things that just, just cause us to get mired into a, a pit of deception. And God wants to break that off our lives. It's not enough to come to God. But we've, we, and just believe. It's not enough to only believe. We must suffer for his sake. Amen? Amen? And we can't do that unless we identify with him. And part of that is saying no to that sin and the compromise. When we come to God and we cry out to him, he, he brings us out of darkness, the psalmist says. But then he says, I break your chains asunder. There are those in this room that still have chains in your life because of the things called idols that you're putting before God. A lot of it's because of the pictures you look at, the books you read, the TV shows you watch, or whatever. It's called compromise because God is jealous and he's after our eyes, he's after our thoughts, he's after our full hearts. Our full hearts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And what you put in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. And it's what's going to control you. He's after a pure heart. A pure heart. And I know how can we get that pure heart it's when we come to that place and say, God, I want to be still before you. I want to spend time with you. I want to spend quiet time with you. You know, I want to carve out that little section of time and say, I'm blocking everything else out. Because when we're in his presence, that's the fullness of joy. Yes, but it's also where we gain wisdom. We gain wisdom. We gain some discernment. We gain direction. And then his still, small voice begins to guide us. But that's when the Holy Spirit begins to not just visit us, but it inhabits us and he rests upon us. Amen. It wasn't Jesus doing the miracles. Amen. It was God in Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit that rested upon him. And he wants the Holy Spirit to rest upon every one of us. He wants us to be like David, a man after his heart, but like Elias, Elias and say, God, give me a double portion, more of you and less of us. Galatians 2.20 reminds us, I'm crucified with Christ and I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. I only got so much time, I ain't got to the testimony yet. Let me see here. <laughs> and Bill, Brother Bill asked me to share my testimony, so let me get back to the testimony. Okay, here's a... 
So, so as I'm climbing down a rope off the top of a five-story building in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the night of September 28, 1978, he should have been the one to climb down the rope. But I was Mr. Macho. Anybody ever been there before? And what does God say? Pride comes before a fall, a haughty spirit before destruction. I jumped over a balcony and let my fall partner, my new homie that knew the guy from Aspen, who had been ripped off, I let him get in the front door. We found a bunch of money, and I wanted to leave, but no, he wanted to wait till the guy came home. And that's when my true colors surfaced.